Well, hello again. This is Steve Ellis with Quest Ministries trying to tackle some of those interesting questions our friends and family are asking about God in life, questions that come up in our conversations, and sometimes we feel a little less than prepared to deal with them. That's why we try to answer these here on our online course called I'm Glad You Ask. And today, we're going to be looking at a question that comes up a lot in our highly educated modern world, and that is, isn't religion just a psychological, emotional crutch? I mean, if you've got all the knowledge and the philosophy you need to process life, why even consider a religion in general? Why even consider Christianity in particular? That's our question here today. And when that comes up, there's really two ways you can go with this idea. You could say that Christianity or religion is merely in a subjective experience. In other words, it's based on feelings or opinions rather than anything factual. Now, let me state from the outset that I do believe Christianity is subjective. I mean, I can experience that. I can feel of that. But I don't think it's merely subjective. I believe the other possibility is true, and that is that it's objectively true. It's based on facts rather than just feelings or opinions. And really, the conclusion I make is it's objectively true. Therefore, it can be subjectively experienced. Let me see if I can explain that in the next few minutes. I like to admit up front, though, that religion can be a crutch. Christianity can be a crutch. Atheism, any other philosophy, can be a crutch. And sometimes it is portrayed that way. Remember, it was Karl Marx who said religion is the opiate of the masses. And by that, he meant we'll have a ruling class politically, economically, and they will look at the masses of people and say, well, we don't want them to revolt and come get what we've got. So let's give them some kind of religion. Let's give them some kind of sweet by and by promise. They'll keep them satiated in that lifetime duh, like a narcotic and they won't come after what we've got while we're living. It can be used as an opiate of the masses, has been used in that way in previous generations. And of course, Sigmund Freud would come along and say religion is an obstinate illusion, a mass neuroses, a way to deal with dangers and unknowns of life. In other words, With all your education, your science and philosophy, you might know a lot, but you may have gaps in that knowledge. And for the unknowns of life and those dangers, you create a mythological, religious idea to explain where did we come from? Where are we going? Why are we here? Has religion been dealt with in that way in the past? Certainly it has been. But neither of these two ideas invalidates the real thing. But sometimes there are objections leveled against Christianity or religion in the psychological realm. For example, preconditioning has caused you to believe. In other words, you were raised by parents or in a culture or in a country that believed a certain way. And so your preconditioning is what made you believe that. It's not the real thing, but you were given that by default. Well, preconditioning doesn't invalidate those true beliefs as well. For example, fire is hot. I can go out on my deck and I can fire up my grill and try to cook my grandchildren some hamburgers and some hot dogs. And as they come close to the grill, I will precondition them. Look, don't touch this. It's hot. It will burn your hand. I will certainly, as a dutiful grandparent, precondition them. That does not invalidate the reality that fire is hot. Another objection that often comes out is beliefs or emotions is what really determines your truth. It's not based in fact. It's just what you want to believe in. It's it's what you feel. But that doesn't necessarily determine truth now, does it? You can believe things strongly. You can feel things strongly. But that doesn't necessarily make it true. I remember as a child, really infatuated with the character Superman. And I got to a place where I believe that I could fly because one Halloween, my mother gave me a Superman suit and I strapped that thing on one afternoon, went outside and got up on the doghouse and tried to jump off because I believed I could fly. But the reality of my belief versus the reality of gravity were in conflict. And guess what? I did not fly. Gravity was much more real than my strong belief. Someone else might say that experience is what determines truth. Whatever you have experienced and feel in the moment, that is your truth. But imagine you go into a doctor's office with some kind of infection that's causing you 
really severe pain. And he says to you, I can give you a choice today. I can give you a shot of morphine. And if I do that, the pain experience will go away immediately. Or I can give you a shot of penicillin. You'll still experience pain for a while, but over time, that pain will go away as the source of that pain goes away. Well, if you took the shot of morphine, your experience would change, but your reality is you're still sick. You still have an infection. Likewise, you could take the shot of penicillin and your experience would tell you, I'm still hurting, therefore I must not be getting better, but in fact you are. So experience does not determine truth. In fact, all three of these objections to religion or Christianity can be turned back on those of us who say we don't believe in any of that. The same objections can be raised, for example, for atheism. Preconditioning or strong belief or experience may be the barometer for that belief system, but the truth is those don't establish or tear down those beliefs as well. Here's the truth. Everybody needs meaning in their life. But wherever they invest their faith, it's only as good as its object. Doesn't matter how much you believe in something, if the object is flawed, your faith is flawed. For example, today there are still people who believe in a flat earth. Can you believe that? They still believe that there's a place called Earth and it's more like a pancake than a sphere. And, and we're just sitting on this flat surface all the time. Here's a, a membership certificate from 1992, 1992. And people as late as that date still believe it. And I got to thinking, well, by that time, hadn't we gone up into the atmosphere with our Gemini mission, taking pictures of the Earth, showing a curve, showing that we were not a flat Earth and the Flat Earth Society at that time said that doesn't negate anything. Those pictures are that way due to atmospheric distortion. But then we got out of the atmosphere. We went to the moon through the Apollo missions. And this is one of the early pictures that were sent back and shown to the then president of the Flat Earth Society to show him the Earth is not flat. And his, this was his exact response to that picture. He said, isn't it amazing how round the Earth looks from up there? He wasn't changing his belief system at all. Even though the scoffers all over the Earth have shown there is no such thing as a flat Earth. No one has been lost walking over the edge. You can go today to their website and see they still believe the Earth is flat. You see, everyone needs meaning in life. But faith is only, is still only as good as its object. Let me see if I can illustrate this. Suppose you're walking through the mountains of Colorado. There you are from North Carolina uh, in the blue hat. And there's your friend from Colorado who lives there walking down the hill in the yellow cap. He knows the terrain. He knows what it's like in the dead of winter. Uh, you're hiking down before it gets dark because you've got to get all the way down to the base of that mountain. And you've got to get to the lodge over there on the left side of that picture. And to get there, there's this frozen lake between you. But your friend from Colorado says, man, we are in luck. Because I know this time of the year, that ice is a foot thick. All we've got to do is travel down this little bit of a hill. We get on the ice, which is secure. It'll hold us up. And he walks all the way across there in a matter of minutes. Didn't really have a lot of faith in the ice, except the ice was very, very thick. But there you are from North Carolina. You say, there's no way I'm putting my foot on that ice from where I come from. We don't trust it. And so you spend hours going around the perimeter of that lake, not trusting the ice because you don't want to break through. And three hours later, you show up at that lodge and join your friend. But let's fast forward a little bit to about uh, the month of May. Situations have changed. You come down the hillside and you come up upon the same scene, but it's May. And even though things look the same, your friend says, look, I got to warn you, it looks the same, but we can't trust that ice. It's gone from a foot thick. And I know right now it's only about a quarter inch thick. But you say, no, 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 I have faith. I believe I have a big quantity of faith from what I saw back in February. And without any caution whatsoever, you take a run down that hill, start crossing that ice, it begins to crack and it swallows you up. Well, what's the point of the story? It's just this. It's not about how much I believe the ice will hold. It's all about the thickness of the ice. Or another way to say that, it's not the quantity of my faith that matters. It's the quality of the faith. If the ice is thick enough, it doesn't really matter how much faith I have. It'll still hold me up. Likewise, it doesn't matter how much I believe. If the ice is thin, 
it won't hold me up. So we got to find the objective reality. We got to drill core samples into the ice to see just how thick it is. Can we show, for example, that Christianity is objectively true? Now, I won't try to reproduce it here, but in previous sessions, you can also find here on YouTube, we have shown that God exists through something we call legal historical proof, through cause and effect reasoning, through the anthropological, the the cosmological, the teleological arguments. You can find those here on YouTube to show that God does exist. And we've shown that ultimately he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who came to the earth and was resurrected again to demonstrate objectively that God exists and that he wants to have a relationship with us through Jesus Christ. So therefore, it's objectively true whether I subjectively experience it or not. But you might say, well, I don't know that I really feel the need for that. I don't really think I have a problem that God needs to fix. But many of us have gone into doctor's offices and subjected ourselves to diagnostics to discover we may need a cure for something even if we don't feel it currently. We may have a problem that needs immediate attention. And thank goodness we find it early enough that a cure can be applied. Paul would address that when he talked to the Ephesian Christians, when he said, because of his great love for us, God, who's rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. In other words, even when we didn't feel like we needed God, even when we were dead, senseless, not sympathetic at all to the cause, God made a cure for us before we even knew we needed one. Or maybe another way to state that is Christianity really isn't a crutch, which would provide minimal assistance. It's really a cure for maximal abundance. Another way to say that is Christianity works because it's true, objectively true, not the other way around. It's not true because it works. It works because it's true. It's objectively true. Therefore, it can be subjectively experienced. That's the reality. It works because it's true. It's been shown historically, reasonably to be true. So as we look back at our original two possibilities, is it merely subjective? No, it's objectively true based on the facts, based on the thickness of the ice, rather than what I think about it, feel about it, or even believe about it. And because it's objectively true, I can experience it and all its abundance. Hey, thanks for listening. Hope this has been helpful and stay tuned with some other sessions here on I'm Glad You Asked.